Um, I've got to confess, I love maps. Okay, I'm a bit obsessed by them, and one of the reasons I like them is we see them everywhere. Um, so you agree to give a talk, and you get sent a map telling you how to get there. Um, in my house, maps are everywhere. We wrap presents in them. Um, this map um, is actually an embroidered map. Um, from 1796. It's actually my wife's four great-grandmother's um, map sampler. They had to learn to stitch, and this is what she stitched. Um, it's quite impressive. My wife's an embroiderer, and she's currently restoring this map. Um, and we're very impressed the condition it's been in, having been not in a museum, but just in the family homes, and passed around from generation to generation. One of the things I love about maps is the fact that they tell stories. And that's why, um, or part of the reason, that we interact so well with maps. They're a great way of communicating information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the story of mapping diseases. Um, starting from the very first map that we know about from disease mapping, which from, was from 1694. Um, and that was mapping plague in Italy at the time. And what was so interesting about these early maps is they were extremely sophisticated. Why we produce maps hasn't really changed. They engage us. They show information in a very nice way. What has changed, and what I'm going to talk about in this talk, is the way that we produce them and how that has changed. So I can't give a public health talk without showing this map. Um, it's Jon Snow's map of cholera in London. And it is by far the most famous map of disease there has ever and will ever be. Um, cholera at the time um, in London, there was an outbreak in 1854. And most people believed it was spread from air, something called miasma, the bad smelling air. But Jon Snow believed it was waterborne, it was from drinking contaminated water. So he set out to prove that. And what he did was he got every single case of cholera and him and friends and a local reverend walked around the area of Soho, finding every single house where there had been a case and noticing where the drinking water came from for that particular house. And what they found, almost without fail, was that these houses were all around the area of Broad Street. So much so that he managed to persuade local officials to take the pump handle off this pump and then the cholera outbreak stopped. John Snow is considered what we call the father of epidemiology, the father of studying these sorts of spread of disease, um, and I think partly due to his map. But what I find so interesting is I don't really like this map. It was used after the outcome. It was, to, it was a PR stunt. He was showing his results. A far more interesting map, for my, and I'm being very controversial in saying this in public health, is something like these smallpox maps in the 1880s. Um, there were three smallpox outbreaks in London. And all cases of smallpox were treated at one of these hospitals that were uh, ringed around the edge of London. But they were very concerned about the fact that smallpox may actually be spread from the hospitals into the local community. So they wanted to examine this. So what they did was they commissioned three maps. And they didn't just commission three maps. They were very clear about the fact that these maps were to show where the cases of smallpox were, which hospital they were treated at, what the outcome was, did the person live or did they die, but also, was there any link in terms of wind direction? Could they find links between the hospitals and where these cases were occurring? The other thing that makes this map so impressive is it's massive. I mean, you can see in the photograph two people standing against it. It's actually five meters long by about three and a half meters wide. Um, it's an absolute nightmare to archive. They had to carry it down the lifts to get it in and out and design all sorts of things to, to, to treat with it. But it shows that people, even in the 1880s, were using maps as a way of researching disease. It's exactly what I do today. If you looked, on the script, if you looked in a little booklet, you'll see you don't have a photo of me, you have a photo of this map. Um, this map is my personal favorite all-time disease map because it shows the whole process. So this shows sleeping sickness, which was an extremely nasty disease and killed hundreds of thousands of people in Africa at the sort of turn of the century, sort of end of the 18th, uh, beginning of the 19th. And what it did was um, the map shows the relationship of sleeping sickness to the environment. So there's a researcher out there mapping where tsetse flies that spread 
sleeping sickness are found, what the vegetation was like in the area. So they used this map to try and find links between the environments. The map then came back to London, and this is an area that you've already heard about today in the Belgium Congo. Um, one of our earlier talks talked about it. And this is a massive gold mining area and very important for the British colony at the time. So it came back to the colonial office, and they looked at the map, and it terrified them. What it showed was sleeping sickness working down towards the mining areas. And if sleeping sickness became endemic in an area, the only object at the time you could do was just to evacuate. So what they did was they said, this is terrible. We have to put an intervention into place. So they took the map, and they went away, and they put up checkpoints coming in and out of the area, and they tested everyone for sleeping sickness. And if you showed any symptoms, you were put in what they optimistically called a treatment center. The sad thing is, and, and I'm a bit optimistic in hoping that this has changed, this had nothing really to do with treating people. This was solely about ensuring that the mining population never became infected and there were always healthy miners to mine our gold and make sure that the British Empire could carry on. Um, but it all comes about from maps. They have a very, very big impact. We're going to skip forward a bit now to the 1990s. And I put 1993 up now, because that's actually the year I started my current job, which looking around today is a bit worrying because most of you weren't actually born when I started my current job. Um, but 1990s were really important for disease mapping for two, issue, two reasons. Firstly, um, we started using computers a lot more. So most of you here won't remember before computers, but um, personal computers were, starting, were, were quite commonly used by then, and we had statistical software, and we could produce maps on them, and we had data sets available in them, and this was all very exciting. Um, but it was also when we sort of reinvented public health mapping. I could show you lots of different maps from this time. Um, this one is an area of Sandwell in the UK, and it shows access to food. I'm sure you've, always been t you've all been told that you should eat healthily, and obesity is a massive global problem. And what this map shows is the access that people in Sandwell have to food within 500 meters of any location. So the dark black lines are roads within 500 meters of a shop selling food. What this map also shows is how you can lie very easily. Because a shop that sells food is any food. What we actually want to know is shops that sell healthy food. So instead of having 80% of the population living we go back, this map, 80% of the population living close to a shop that sells food. The real picture is that we've got 20% of the population living within 500 or walking distance of a shop that sells fruit and veg. This had a massive impact on the local authority. They were horrified by this, and they actually encouraged and gave grants to local food um, providers to set up mobile vans which would go into the local communities and deliver fruit and veg. Um, and this was one of the original home delivery services before all the big supermarkets started doing it as routine. But again, it was a map that had the impact. Just for fun, we mapped what your access to chocolate or cigarettes was like, and it's pretty much the same. Um, we tend to live close to all the bad things and far away from all the good things. Um, although in chocolate, I must admit, I'm quite pleased that I'm never more than 10 minutes walk from um, a bit of chocolate. Um, so 42, not a year this day. Um, any of the older audience may recognize the number 42. It's particularly important from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy um, as the meaning of life, universe, and everything. Okay? I had to do over 200 studies before I managed to do a piece of research that gave me the answer to 42. But I did finally manage it, and that is looking at road traffic crashes, or road traffic collisions, as we have to call them. We're very lucky in the UK. We've got very low rates of road traffic injury. Um, if you were in many other countries, you would all definitely know people who had been seriously injured um, in a road traffic collision. Um, the other reason we're very lucky in the UK is the data is readily available. Every time there is a collision and the police are called, they record all this information on a form called STATS19, and that's available to us. So instantly, I can just download this data set and I can put it on a map. So this map shows all collisions between 1986 and 2006 um, by, what should I put it, um, killed, seriously injured, and slight injury. And we can map on anything we want. 
Now, I'm sure you've all seen the slogan, Speed Kills. Yep. And we use these statistics to put interventions into place. So what we do is we say, let's slow the traffic speed down from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. And this is based on some form of evidence. But we wanted to look in a much bigger way at what that evidence was. So we took every single 20 mile an hour zone, so that's every area where they put engineering measures like speed bumps and things like that, and we took 20 years worth of data, so every 20 mile an hour zone in London, and we had 1.4 million road segments, and we assigned every road segment whether it was inside a zone or outside, and we looked at what had happened to road traffic collisions in that area. And what we found, um, what we found is if you put a 20 mile an hour zone in, you instantly reduce um, road injury by 42%. Okay. And that's pretty hard to argue with. It's very hard for anyone to say it's not a benefit. And in fact, it's better still because it reduces serious injuries and those killed by even more. And it also is better for the young and the old, what we call our at-risk populations. So it's win-win-win. There's no bad 5 to 20 miles an hour speed limit. And because of that, the government then changed the regulations and now you're allowed to implement massive what they call 29 an hour zones or 29 an hour speed limits. And you've got areas like Portsmouth with the first one, Brighton, Camden in London, all sorts of places are making their whole area 20 mile an hour speed limit. Um, I'm also not very popular in a lot of these places uh, when people find out that's because of me. The second big change was um, in data sources being available. You're all very used to turning on your computers, looking online, and finding lots of geographical data. Um, and that is a massive benefit to us. Satellite images now are extremely detailed. If you zoom in to a satellite photograph, and we've already had one today, if you zoom in and zoom in, you'll see little squares. And the US government changed the regulations last year and said that those squares can represent an area of 30 centimeters on the Earth's surface. So if you look at the seat that you are sitting on, if we put that outside, that would show up on a, satellite, on a photograph from space. And that allows us a massive amount of information. So I can now see all my buildings. I can see my road network. So instead of having to physically, physically go out and visit that location, I can sit in front of my computer, and I can just click on houses. And, and we use that a lot. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of how we use that. The second big example um, change is GPS, Global Positioning System. And for those of you taking maths who think that trigonometry is useless and you're never, ever going to use it, GPS, your sat-nav, your phone, all work from trigonometry. Okay. Um, and what that allows us to do is to go into any place in the world, turn on my GPS receiver, and get the X and Y coordinate of where I'm standing to the accuracy of a couple of meters. So I can go into my town in, uh, in Ghana, and I can walk around the houses that I'm surveying that maybe have my HIV cases, or are suffering from malnutrition, and I can do my survey, and then I can record the position of that house. I can record where the safe drinking water is. I can record where my, maybe my mosquito breeding sites are, and I can use that all, all that information. I can also dress my poor field workers up in ridiculous outfits um, with crash helmets on and send them out with antennas on their heads to drive, cycle around the road networks and map all my road networks. Um, but far bigger than that, the biggest impact in terms of technology is mobile phones. Now, a lot of you sitting here will be, probably be fairly mobile phone obsessed, I'm guessing, um, and will have had them surgically attached to you. Um, mobile phones have had a massive impact on how we map diseases and what we're expecting to find. An important date for that, 2007. Um, I've chosen that date because it was the release of the first iPhone. And that is when mobile phones really became the types of thing that we're used to seeing now. And the reason that mobile phones are so important is that we have them with us all the time. They contain a phone. They, we can text from them. They have cameras. But they also have internet access. And we use them, social media. So you're tweeting. You're sending text messages. You're sending, updating Facebook profiles, doing all the other messaging that you do. Um, you can collect data on them, so I can use them as little computers. I can go out and do a survey on my phone. Um, and then I put social media twice, because social media is obviously so important. The other thing about your phone is that it's all GPS tagged. So everything you do comes with a location. So when you send that text message, I know whereabouts you were when you sent it. 
We've used that a huge amount. So for the Ebola outbreak, for instance, um, we mapped the area using a network of people sitting around the world, and we got them to map the road networks in the affected areas of Sierra Leone or Guinea or Liberia. We mapped cases. Where are our cases occurring? Um, we also mapped rumors. We can now transmit information so quickly. So not only can we transmit good information, we can also transmit bad information. So especially around a disease which are like Ebola, which is so sensitive, um, a lot of bad information was transmitted. Um, we can use free phone numbers. So you can set up a free phone number, and then you can text or phone that free phone number and say that you've got symptoms. And then an ambulance will be sent to your address, and they'll pick you up and take you to the clinic. Um, very sadly, because there's a stigma ar around Ebola, people didn't want to report they had, they had a body, so they would take the body out into the street and just leave it in the village. And then they would text in that there is a body in that particular village. Because there was a lot of stuff that went on around what happened if you were found with a body. You had to be quarantined. A lot of your stuff may have been burnt. Um, so it was very, very traumatic. Um, when you send that text, someone would come and collect the body and they would bury it in a dignified and safe manner. If it was with a house, they would arrange with the family how they wanted it to be buried. Our maps have changed because of the way we expect to see data now. We don't like to see static maps and we want it on our phone. So now we have interactive maps. We have what we call dashboards. So this is a typical dashboard we'd see now again. It's called three W's. Who is working where and what are they doing? And what this map does, it allows, or what this page does, it allows you to click on things. So I can click on a part of a map and I can see who's doing what in that location. If I was inter interested in dignified and safe burials, I could click on dignified and safe burials and see who was doing what where. Um, I can map my cases. So again, it's interactive, so I can choose a time period I'm interested in. I can animate it, um, all stuff like that. Notice we've, no, we've moved from individual dots to areas now. And the thing about that is that that's because of confidentiality. There's a certain irony that if Jon Snow was alive today and produced his map, he would have been disbarred, he would have been kicked out of any academic institution, and he would have been left in total disgrace. A lot of the maps that I produce, I'm never allowed to show anyone. So I give a lot of talks which are very frustrating. I can't show you any data because it's all too confidential. Um, the same with the earthquakes in Nepal, um, very current. Their mobile phones were used in an even more immediate effect with people texting where there was damage. So this map shows text messages and individual people saying that there's people injured here, that the school's been damaged, or food is needed in this location, or been a landslide. Um, so I'll just end on my 321, which is 321 years of Ebola mapping, uh, of disease mapping. And the only difference during that time is we now all expect it to be instantaneous and provided on our mobile phones. Thank you.